Good morning and welcome to our digital worship service here at Calvary Baptist Church. We're so excited that you have joined us this morning. Now, uh, many of you have received a few notifications throughout this past week. Uh, one went out several days ago and another one went out just last night informing you that we have suspended services at Calvary uh, because we had someone call into the office with different symptoms, uh, fever, achiness, uh, since then, we have received information that they did test positive for COVID-19. Uh, as a result, we are taking every precaution we can. We are suspending service this week. We are also suspending service next week, allowing for all of our Calvary family to observe a 14-day quarantine period. Uh, and then we will resume services on our campus July 26th. Uh, and so if you would like to be getting information with those kind of updates, I just encourage you to go ahead and sign up for our text notification system. Uh, you can sign up to that system by texting the word member to the number on your screen. Uh, also, if you would like to receive email updates about different things happening at our church, just visit our website at BradentonCalvary.org and fill out the contact card there and simply request to be added to our distribution list. Um, and so if you want to get all kinds of updates that are happening here at Calvary, I really encourage you sign up either for text messages or emails or both, and you'll always be in the loop, uh, especially with all that's going on right now in our country. But we are excited to be gathering together this morning uh, continuing our series as we look at some of the most famous worship songs and some of my personal favorites that we sing here in church. This week we will be looking at In Christ Alone. And so as we gather and prepare our hearts for worship this morning, let us pray as we go before the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the wonderful work you have done. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together this way and continue to sing praises to your name. And Lord, we ask that as we move forward today, that you would remove all distractions from this place. We ask, Lord, that you would guide our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would make us more like your son, Jesus, and prepare us to hear from your perfect word. We love you and we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh.
Amen. It is so good to worship the Lord together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. And what beautiful words those are to sing and praise our Lord with. Um, It brings up a very interesting topic of conversation, especially in the culture that we live in today. You know, if you look at the landscape of morality, if you look at the landscape of just general attitude and, and general perception of the world, saying to someone that there is only one way, that in Christ alone my hope is found, and that outside of him there is no hope, outside of him there there is no joy, outside of him there is no salvation, and there is no forgiveness. That is not a popular mindset to hold in our culture today. In fact, if you look at the landscape of our culture, what we see is we see that, that personal choice and personal freedom ranks supreme above all else. I mean, just think about some of the things that you have seen in the news, uh, some of the ways that people are depicted in popular television shows. Uh, maybe you've seen different protests taking place around your community. And you see pretty quick that personal freedom is, is the most important thing to most people. People want to be completely in charge of their bodies. They want to be completely in charge of their lives. They want to be completely in charge of their orientation. They even want to be completely in charge of their gender. And as we look at scripture, we see a very different worldview at play. See, where the world says you are in charge of your body and you own your body, we as Christians say our bodies are a living sacrifice to God. And and our bodies don't just belong to us, but they belong to Jesus Christ because he has bought us with a price and therefore we can't do whatever we want with them. But we can only use them to serve, honor, and glorify him. And you just see in that one simple example just how different our worldviews are. We believe in absolute truth. We believe in in objective moral values. And yet the world says that, no, 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 morality is relative. And whatever you believe is fine for you as long as you don't incringe upon what I believe. And in fact, some people have gone so far as to try to present, present the idea that all world religions are the same. They say that, you know, really world religions fundamentally all say the same thing. It's just they're superficially different. And what's crazy about that is you don't have to spend very long looking at some of the basic tenets of different world religions to realize that that's just not true. And no matter how much our culture tries to promote or push this idea, a a simple reading of the scripture tells us that it just can't be true. You can't tell me that the way to, to happiness, fulfillment, and nirvana is through the five uh, pillars of Islam when the Bible says that really the way to forgiveness and true peace in heaven is through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And, And what we need to understand and realize is that as we discuss the idea of the exclusivity of Jesus, it, 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 it is a good idea for us to take a moment to realize that Christianity is not the only faith that makes exclusive claims. No, if you look at any different faith, any different religious teaching, they make exclusive claims. And by stating that this thing is true, they're stating that the other alternatives are not true. You know, take Buddhism, for example. Buddhism says the way to peace and the way to enlightenment and the way to understanding is by removing desire from your life. They say that unhappiness is simply unmet desire. And so therefore, if you remove desire from your life, well, then you're going to reach true peace and and, and you're going to be at one with the world and you're going to reach this state of bliss in life. Well, we as Christians, we understand that the reason we are not happy, the reason we don't have joy is because of sin. And we say that our only true peace and joy is found in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, if if all religions are fundamentally the same and all religions are are leading to the same place, well, how how can you tell me that the destruction of desire on one hand leads to peace and joy? And then we say, no, it, it is Jesus Christ that leads to peace and joy and desiring him all the more. See, the two can't exist. And that's just one example of a thousand. See, truth be told, the basic religions of the world 
are fundamentally different and, and at the very best superficially similar. And one of the tenets that we see in Scripture is, is the fact that our peace, our joy, our, our salvation, our forgiveness, what ensures us entry into God's kingdom is Christ and Christ alone. And as we look through the scriptures this morning, that is exactly what we are going to see. If you'll open up your Bibles with me to John chapter 13. Uh, as we look at this text this evening, um, we are jumping right into the middle of the Last Supper. We are seeing that Jesus has gathered his disciples. It's the night before his trial and crucifixion take place. It's the last moment he's going to have to spend with his disciples, to teach them, to encourage them, to, to uplift them, because he knows the work that they have to do. They're going to have to go on and, and found the church. They're going to have to present the gospel. They're going to have to evangelize. They're, they're going to have a lot of work ahead of them. And Jesus is using this opportunity to pour into their hearts, pour into their lives. And some of the most famous teaching in all of the Bible is found right here in these chapters in John and the very lengthy passages of Scripture that deal with the Last Supper in this Gospel. And so that's where we're jumping in. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples as they share the Last Supper together, as they celebrate the Passover. And he's going to be giving them some encouragement. And he's going to be opening their eyes to an uncomfortable fact from where they sit. And that's the fact that he isn't going to be with them much longer. But instead, he's going to be going away. And so before we start our, our, our trip through John chapter 13, let's pray together and prepare our hearts and just get ready for what God has to show us this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the work that you have done. We thank you for the joy that you have placed in our hearts. And we thank you for this wonderful, beautiful, precious gift, the gift of your Holy Word. I pray, Lord, that, that we never take it for granted. I pray, Lord, that, that we never belittle the truth of your Word, Lord, and we never belittle the value that it holds in our lives. I pray that as we look into your Scriptures now that you would illuminate the text for us that you would speak directly through our heart, to our hearts, through your word. And that, Lord, you would allow us to spend this time learning about you and growing about you. But also, Lord, we pray that your spirit would transform us and change us, making us more and more like your son, Jesus. That's the goal of our hearts. That's what we want this morning, Lord. We want to be like you. So help us, please, because we can't do this without you. We love you. We praise you and we thank you for this precious gift, all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We start in John chapter 13, verse 36. And the text says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Now understand that at this point in Scripture, the disciples have been following Jesus for, for almost three years and, and, and they have learned his ways, they've learned his teaching, they have left businesses, they've left family behind, they've left security and safety behind, all to follow after their teacher, Jesus. And now Jesus is saying that, that I'm going away. He's saying, where I'm going, <laughs> you can't come. You can't follow me right now. But... You are going to come afterwards. And of course, you know, Peter, being the loud mouth of the group, he steps up and he says, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. What do you mean I can't come with you? I, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus just, you know, laughs. He knows what's going to happen. He knows that Peter's going to deny him. And he gives him that warning right off the bat. And so as I, if I was sitting at the table at that moment, if I was sitting with Jesus, the question that I would have for him is, well, first of all, okay, so yeah, where are you going? Where are you going, Lord? Well, what, why, why can't I come with you? Where are you going? And the second question I would have is, why can't we follow you? We've been following you for three years now. Are you going to a dangerous part of the city? I'll come. 
Are you going to a far off country? I'll come. It doesn't matter where you go. I want to go. Why can't I go with you? And, and it doesn't take us, you know, a, um, a very far trip into the next chapter to find out some of the answers to the first question. When we ask the question, where is Christ going? We see he tells them very plainly in, in John chapter 14, verse 28. If you turn just a page or two over to John chapter 14, verse 28, the text reads, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Oh, and so Jesus answers the question very plainly. He's not going to another part of the country. He's not going to some far off distant land to continue his ministry work. No, he's going home. He is going back to the Father. And, and he says, if you knew that, you'd rejoice. And so that answers the question as to where he's going. He is going back to his Father. But now the question still remains, why can't the disciples follow him now? Well, there's a few different reasons. There's the physical reason of the, the, the path that they have to take, the path that Jesus has to take, leads through the cross. He's going to be crucified. His life is going to be, be laid down for the sin of the world. And then after his death, burial and resurrection, he's going to ascend back to the Father. And, and of course, the disciples can't follow him through that road yet because they've got work to do. They've got to go in through the book of Acts and found the church. They've got to spread the gospel. They've got to tell other people of who Jesus is and what he's done. But there's another reason they can't follow him right now. There's another reason they can't go directly to the Father. And that's because the way hasn't been cleared yet. The path has not been, been set before them. You know, if you look into the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, we get a really clear picture of kind of the problem that we have as human beings. Now, in Isaiah chapter 59, this is a passage of Scripture where God is rebuking Israel. And, and God is laying out some pretty harsh judgment against Israel. But we also see that every person outside of Christ finds themselves in the exact same position. So look, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, the text says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For the hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. Yeah, and we see if you continue on reading in chapter 59 of Isaiah that the list of sins they commit is just, you know, goes on and on and on and on. You know, these were, were the, the Israelites had wandered away from God and God was judging them for it. And what we need to realize that in Scripture tells us that that each of us has gone astray. No one follows after God, no, not one, but all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned our own way. And that's kind of the, the, the position the disciples are still in because Jesus hasn't died for the sins of the world. They're still under condemnation of the law because Jesus hasn't paved the way. He's going to in just a few days. But, but we see that, that right now where they sit, they can't follow him. And so Jesus, probably seeing the look on their face, I mean, he's looked around, he said, I'm leaving you and you can't come with me. And they're probably shocked. Peter's utterance that's recorded here in Scripture probably isn't the only thing that was said around that table. You know, the, the disciples were always kind of jockeying for position. Most likely, many of them started to say, no, Lord, we'll follow you. Please tell us where you're going. Tell us where you're going. And, and Jesus in his compassion, Jesus in his great love for them, he continues to encourage them as we go into John chapter 14. Looking at John chapter 14, verse 1, the text says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, and where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. 
And so, oh, you just, you just get a sense of the love that Jesus has for his disciples as he, he gives them this bit of encouragement. He reminds them and says, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's going to prepare a place in God's kingdom through his death on the cross, through the sacrifice that he's going to make. He goes to make the way clear and to prepare the place in God's kingdom for them so that they can stand before God holy and pure and righteous. And that's what he's going to do. And he says, of course, I'm going to prepare a place, and I promise you I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you. And then he says the most peculiar thing. And if I was sitting at the table, I would look at this statement, and I would think, what are you talking about? He, he looks at them in verse 4 and says, and you know the way to where I'm going. He says, you know the way. Now, he just told them they can't follow. And yet now he's told them that they know the way, and, and, and I would be very confused. If I know the way, why can't I follow you, Lord? And, and what do you mean I know the way? I don't even know where you're going. I don't even know what's happening. What, what, what's taking place here? And that's the same frustration that we see in Thomas's heart, because in the very next verse, verse 5, Thomas says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Oh, and, and you just hear the cry of someone who so desperately loves Jesus. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How, are we, how can we know the way if we don't even know where you're going? How can we know, Lord? It's a cry that says, I just want to be with you. It's a cry that says, I, I just can't imagine being apart from you. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You know, I, I remember being a little kid in a department store with my mom. And, you know, we were shopping for clothes or something like that, really boring. And I'm sitting there just bored to tears as, you know, five, six-year-old Chuck. And, 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 and all of a sudden, as I'm kind of scanning through the department store, I see this display. And the display had Thomas the Tank Engine stuff all over it. And I don't remember if it was toys or shirts or what it was, but I just remember I love Thomas the Tank Engine. And so I walked up to that display and I start picking up whatever it is that they're showing off and I'm looking at it and all these kind of things. And, and, and it must have been, you know, 30 seconds had gone by, but all of a sudden I look up and start to scan around and my mom's not where I left her. My mom isn't where I walked away from her. And I remember I start walking through the department store. I start looking around and trying to scan, seeing if I recognize my mom anywhere. And, and after what felt like an eternity, but what I am now sure was the matter of a few minutes, uh, I, I just start to cry. And I tears well up in my eyes, and, and I'm just freaking out, not knowing where she is. And then all of a sudden, you know, before I know it, my mom's at my side. And she's right there, and she's saying, what's wrong? And I remember looking at her saying, I couldn't find you. And oh my goodness, the whole world of that little kid was just destroyed and broken and shattered on the ground. I remember thinking to myself, I don't know how to get home. I don't know the way home. And, and I'm never going to see my family again. And all these fears start welling up in, in, in the heart of that little kid. And, and that's something akin to what I think Thomas felt as he was sitting there looking at Jesus, looking at him saying, Jesus... We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? How can we know the way? And then Jesus responds with one of the most well-known, famous passages in all of the Bible. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Oh, and Jesus looks at him and says, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's me. I'm going back to my Father. And you want to know how to get to your Father? You want to know how to get to, to that perfect peace? You want to know how to get to God? It's through me. It's through me. 
and, and as if he wanted to make himself crystal clear, not allowing any room for doubt to be left in the hearts and minds of those around him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and that leaves no other option. And, and this is kind of the crux of Christianity, that we place our faith and we place our trust in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. And that makes our faith extremely unpopular in the world. You, know, you go to the average person on the street and you say that they need to follow Jesus, they need to trust in Jesus. And their immediate response is one of indignance. Their immediate response is, is, you know, one of something like, well, listen, how could you be so narrow-minded? How could you be so close-minded and simple? How could you be so, so hateful and spiteful and bigoted? Because you sit there and say that Jesus is the only way. And, and that response is really peculiar for us Christians because we sit there and we think to ourselves, okay, we have the way to be forgiven of sin and enter into eternal life. You know, what, what is the one problem that plagues all of humanity, even in the secular world's mindset, is death. Now, we know the root cause of all things is sin, and sin is the major problem of the world. But even the secular world, even a world that doesn't believe God exists, looks and says, yeah, death is kind of the universal equalizer of all men. All men face death. And, and if anyone could figure out how to avoid it and escape it, well, they'd be rich overnight selling whatever it is that they found. And the funny thing is, is that we found the cure to that problem and it doesn't cost a dime. We found the cure to the greatest problem that man has ever known. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And yet we offer that to the world and they look at us and they say, you bigot, you narrow-minded, you hateful person. How dare you say that we have to follow this Jesus? And in their arrogance, they, they spit in his face. And it's just baffling to us. It's just mind-boggling to us how anyone could look at this precious gift and call us hateful when, when sharing the gospel is the biggest, greatest act of love that we can perform. Why is that? Well, it's because the world has a misconception as to what the gospel actually is. And that's because they don't understand what truth is. See, we live in a world that, that says that truth is relative. That truth can be whatever you believe or whatever you want it to be. You know, you don't like the way that you are. Well, just identify as something else. You know, you don't like the, the morality that, that our culture lives in. Well, just live by your own code. And kind of as long as you're not hurting anybody else, doesn't matter what you do. What you do behind closed doors is your own business. That's the, that's the, the popular theory of our culture. And that mindset has found its way into religious thought. You know, how many of you ha have seen that famous bumper sticker? That, that so many people have on their cars where it has all the different religious symbols on it and it says coexist. You seen that before? I see so many of them driving around here in Bradenton and, and it has this idea that sounds really nice. That hey, let's all just live together in harmony. Let's all just live together in peace. And you know what? We're all going to believe what we believe and that's just okay. And it sounds really nice, but here's the problem. The love of the Christian doesn't allow us to do that because the love of the Christian says we need to explain to you who Jesus is because he's the answer to the greatest problem that you have. He is the one that can cleanse you of sin and it's him and it's him alone. To the Christian, the idea of simply coexisting with other people is to stand by and watch them walk into judgment of their own volition. And I, I hope that your heart is one that loves too much to let that happen. And yet the world believes that's what we should do. You see, the world has this mindset and this idea that says, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe, we're all getting to the same place anyways. I remember being in elementary school and I was spending the night at a friend's house. And, and you know, for some reason, my friend and I would talk about religion all the time. I was really active in church. He was really active in his synagogue, and we would sit there and we would talk 
You know, he, we, we, we would talk about God and the Old Testament. We would talk about the Bible. We would talk about, you know, who Jesus was. And I remember one night late at night just talking to him, and I was saying that, you know, Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. You can't be forgiven of your sin without Jesus. You can't be admitted into the kingdom without Jesus. And we're sitting there having this talk, and all of a sudden the door to his bedroom opens. And my friend's father walks in, and he says, Hey, I've been listening to you guys have this conversation. Let me explain something to you. And he said, If I wanted to get into, if I wanted to take a trip to New York City, you know, I could buy an airplane ticket, and I could hop on my airplane, and I could fly, you know, over the coast, and we would land at JFK, and there we would be in New York. You know, what I could also do is I could also buy a ticket to a train. I could drive up to the train station, and I could ride the train all the way up to New York. You know, I could also get in a boat, and I could just cruise on up the coastline, park my boat in a harbor up there, and then I'd be in New York, too. Or, you know what, I could even drive my car. And it would take me a day or two to get there, but I could drive my car to New York. And you see, there are so many different paths and there are so many different ways that you can get from here to New York. And he said, and God's the same way. You, know, you believe in the Bible, you believe in the New Testament, you believe in Jesus. That's wonderful and that's good. And it's good that you believe that because it leads you to God. And we believe in the Old Testament and we believe that we are still waiting for the Messiah. But guess what? We still love God. And so we get to the same place, and it's all okay. And I remember after explaining that to us, he walked out the door and he left, and the only thing I could say to my friend was, that's not true. That's not right. And yet so many people in the world believe that. So many people in the world think that way because they think that religion is a matter of opinion. They think that religion is something that we just cooked up to make us feel good. They believe that we invented God in our own image and that he doesn't even really exist. And so whatever you believe about morality and eternity, it's just fine. Just don't bother anybody with it. And yet we know that's not true. We understand that our religious beliefs and our religious convictions, they're not, they're not just made up. They're fact, plain and simple. And we know that the, the claims of Jesus Christ are exclusive and that without him there is no hope for the world. Uh, flip to your Bibles to John chapter 3, verse 35. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist is baptizing people and then Jesus shows up on the scene and people start to flock to Jesus to be baptized instead. And when the, his other disciples ask him, hey, how do you feel about that, John? How do you feel about so many people going over to Jesus? He talks and he answers them talking about how much greater Christ is than he and how glad he is that Christ has come. And, and look what John says about Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 35, it says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. That's a very simple statement. And here it is made from the very onset of Jesus' ministry. That if you do not obey the Son, if you do not obey Jesus Christ, the wrath of God remains on you. There's, there's nothing relative about that. If you believe in Jesus, you see eternal life. If you don't, then the wrath of God remains on you, plain and simple. Look, look over to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. In this passage of Scripture, we see that there Peter is preaching and talking to the people. And he says to them in verse 12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among man by which we must be saved. See, we see that there's no other name that we can be saved by. We cannot be saved in the name of Abraham. We cannot be saved in the name of Allah or Muhammad. We cannot be saved in the name of Buddha. We cannot be saved in the name of, of, of any of the other world faiths and religions. But we have the exclusive claim of Jesus Christ. We find salvation in Him and Him alone. 
And, and that carries all through the scriptures, even into the book of Revelation. Look in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, starting in verse 9. And in this passage, we see, you know, the lamb is, is standing there and the one who is slain, they're saying he is worthy to open the scrolls. He's worthy to open the scrolls. And, and if we go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, these angelic beings that are flying around the throne of God, they begin to praise and they begin to sing. And look what they say concerning Jesus. In verse 9, it says, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. By your blood you've ransomed people for God from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, by your blood, by the blood of Jesus. Now, how can we say that all the world religions are similar? How can we say that all the different faiths of the world are the same? How can we say that we're all getting to the same place when we stand boldly and claim that the only way that you can be set right, the only way you can be forgiven, the only way you can be transformed, and the only way that you will ever see the kingdom of God is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, by trusting in his sacrifice, by placing all of your faith in Christ alone. Now, Christ is exclusive. Christ is is exclusive, but not in the way the world thinks. See, the world thinks that, that you've got to be good enough or that we preach that only us Christians are good enough to be in heaven and that we're the only ones that are going to be forgiven. So they look at us with scorn. But, but we understand that, that wide is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness and that few will find it. And that while the gospel is called out to all the world. We know that only a few will come because the only way they can is through Jesus Christ. See, this isn't opinion that we're dealing with. It's truth and fact. And truth is truth regardless of what you think or perceive. Truth stands firm in spite of observation. And, and, and rather than being a vague opinion or, you know, that whole road trip metaphor that, that people like to throw around, you know, it's as if all of a sudden you gathered five people together and one person said, oh, well, I want to go and take a train. Another person said, oh, well, I want to drive a car. Another person said, oh, well, I think that we should go and just fly up. It'll be faster that way. And that everyone's got their opinion of how it should be done. And each person's opinion is perfectly valid. That's not the way that this works. But no, it's more akin to this. Imagine that there you were standing in a vast desert and, and spotted across this desert were different oases. And each oasis had a spring of water that was bubbling up from it. But as you went out and you scouted the landscape, you saw that every single one of those oases, every single one of it was just bubbling up poison. And that if you were to bend down and you were to drink that water, that you would surely die. But then you found the one. You find that one oasis that has water that is crisp and clean and pure. You find that one oasis that is refreshing, that can fill you, hydrate you, and sustain your life. And then you are standing in front of a vast crowd of people. Do you think it would be kindness to look at that group of people and say, hey guys, take whichever one you want. They're all good water. And, and as long as you think that's the one you want, that's okay. No, that wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be kind. That wouldn't be understanding. That wouldn't be tolerant. That would be evil. To stand knowing the truth that there is only one oasis that's going to save these people. There's only one oasis that's going to give them the water they so desperately need to survive. There's only one oasis that's going to deliver them from death. 
and for you to stand there with your mouth shut saying, do whatever you want, believe whatever you want, it's okay. No, you look at those people and you say, these are poison, these are death, they lead to destruction, they, they lead to the end of your life. If you want to live, you follow me to the one way, you follow me to this one place that's going to bring you salvation. And that's the mindset that we have as we proclaim Christ. Because Christ is exclusive. There is no other way. The wellspring of Islam is poison and it leads to death. The wellspring of Mormonism is poison and it leads to death. The wellspring of, of Buddhism is poison and it leads to death. The wellspring of atheism is poison and it leads to death. The only fountain of living water is Jesus Christ. And as we go forward, we preach Christ crucified and we praise him because in Christ alone our hope is found. Let us praise him together this morning.
guess, in Christ alone. Oh, it's such a beautiful sentiment. I hope that, that as you go out today, that you remember that, that all of our hope and all of our faith is in Jesus Christ because He is not a way, but He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the joy that we have in serving you. We thank you for the love that you have given us. And we thank you for the joy that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us go out today and boldly proclaim the gospel. Let us go out today and boldly proclaim what you have done for us, what you have given us, and that we have the way. We have found that narrow path, and it is through your Son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross. I pray, Lord, that as we go out this week, that we would share the good news of the gospel with those that we come in contact with, with those whom we love, with those whom we barely know. Every opportunity we have, let us point people in the direction to the one source of life, your Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you have shown us. And thank you, Lord, that you died for us forgiving us of our sins, allowing us to follow after you, making us holy, righteous, and pure, and allowing us to one day stand before the Father and be admitted into your eternal kingdom. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. It is far more than we could ever deserve. We love you and we praise you all in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. I hope you have a wonderful day, and God bless.